Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this second day of the International Dialogue on Migration, entitled Understanding Migrant Vulnerabilities, a solution-based approach towards a global compact that reduces vulnerabilities and empowers migrants. Our topic this morning is for Panel 4, Integration and Social Inclusion as a means of addressing and mitigating migrant vulnerabilities and we will have from now until 11.30. Let me start first of all by saying a few words and also introducing myself. I'm Anastasia Crickley. I'm chairperson of the Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, one of the treaty bodies uh, of the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, which we monitor and which 178 of the states most of whom are, I think, in this room, have already ratified and report under. I would like at the outset to congratulate all who have been involved in putting together this dialogue and particularly to acknowledge the role of IOM. Indeed, as Bill Swing said yesterday morning, international law is a solid basis and a solid starting point for the discussions and for the dialogue, because this is an opportunity for an open dialogue and exchange at a staging post, really, in the development of the compacts. And I believe that it can and should touch everybody. But what we have now, and what indeed Bill Swing also said yesterday morning, is we have a historic opportunity to amplify the practice issues, to amplify and articulate the issues in practice in implementing and creating the conditions where not just humane but also rights-based approaches can be adopted. We have an opportunity to, and indeed I welcome the way in which a number of people yesterday attempted this, to reshape the narrative, to reshape the narrative in a way that's based on data, based on the realities of what actually happens, based on our understanding of what's involved, and based also on the contribution of people referred to as migrants. We have an opportunity to propose simple steps that can link that reality with both a humane and rights-based approach. Simple steps, but not simplistic reactions, I would suggest. And I think sometimes we confuse simple steps with simplistic reactions. Because simple steps also acknowledge the complexities, as many of you did yesterday, and also acknowledge the link between the humane management of migration, which is an absolute essential, and its underpinning with the human rights commitments that you have made. In, so that you can come in the end, as was articulated yesterday, to a comprehensive, coherent, and monitored approach. The work of the Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination is grounded in such practical steps, linking law to local. I would like here to welcome the New York Declaration's acknowledgement of racism and racial discrimination as key barriers for the Global Compact. And I would also like to acknowledge very explicitly the way in which the New York Declaration uh, articulates a human rights framework as an essential starting point for the compact and for its negotiation. Indeed, this is something that all of the treaty bodies see as very important. Speaking for myself, as someone who has been a migrant working in the UK with Irish migrants throughout the 1970s, which, if some of you are old enough to recall, might not have been the easiest time to be an Irish migrant in the UK or working with Irish migrants in the UK, and having a long-term commitment to issues of migration and to how we manage them and make them appropriately rights-based. I think this workshop is a really, this session of the workshop is a really important one. I'm very conscious as an Irish person of the way in which in the countries we come from, we move from being migrant countries, countries which send migrants, to being countries which host migrants, to being a combination of the two. And the way in which those dynamics play out both at an individual and a collective level as we consider those issues. I'm conscious also of the language and the way in which we talk about things. The term integration 
and what it's come to mean. And I know that this is what all of my colleagues on the panel will be discussing with you this morning. Are we really talking about what we used to call assimilation? Or are we actually talking about an accommodation that creates the conditions for social justice and, a reali and the realities of a changing globalized world? And what do we mean by inclusion? <clears throat> do we mean welcoming people in to our reality, which continues to put our fears against their rights and their contribution? Or do we actually mean acknowledging that in each and every area where we are based, and in each and every community we come from, that there is no such thing as a we that does not also include people from a global reality? And can we also get beyond those simplistic strategies as I have already spoken to? Let me say then, I think that historic opportunity which we began to grapple with yesterday, as we move forward to today, it provides us also with the chance to consider that language and to get beyond things like pity, which lead to patronization and prejudice. You had a lot of discussion yesterday also about a holistic approach and a rights-based approach. And they need to think carefully when we talk about vulnerability and vulnerabilization. Talk, when we talk about these things in individual as opposed to structural terms, and when we talk about them in ways that can sometimes blame those we consider to be vulnerable. I would also ask you, and as I look forward this morning, to a rigorous discussion can I ask us also to think a little bit about what we mean by a solution-based approach? What solution, for who, and in whose interests? I look forward to that discussion this morning. I think this is, as I said, a unique opportunity to build on that solid start that was made yesterday and to your contributions. I've invited the panel to speak for no more than eight minutes, and I look forward to lots of contributions from all of you here, asking you again to keep them short. So with, without further ado, I would like to introduce the first member of the panel this morning. Marina Del Coral is Secretary General of Immigration and Emigration at the Ministry of Employment and Social Security of Spain since 2012. She was previously the General Counsel of the pharmaceutical company Sanofi and she worked as a legal advisor of the NGO, NGO CP, which, uh, which the main function of which is the integration of Latin American immigrants in Spain. Marina, the floor is yours. You have already explained to me that you will need to leave early, so I am just letting the rest of our colleagues this morning know that. Over to you. Colegas, gracias. Gracias a todos. Muchísimas gracias, Anastasia, por esta introducción um, que ha sido perfecta y que nos permite eh, tratar eh, directamente las cuestiones que, que se han suscitado en este panel. Eh, quería dar las gracias a OIM por uh, brindarnos la oportunidad de expresar todas la, las políticas que hacemos desde eh, los gobiernos eh, para, para, en materia de integración y quería, por supuesto, saludar a todos los compañeros de panel. Eh, dirigiéndome, eh, contestando a la primera pregunta, ¿cómo se puede fomentar la integración e inclusión social de los migrantes en la sociedad de acogida? Eh, quería partir de una premisa que me parece muy relevante y es que debemos considerar las migraciones no como un problema, porque hoy eh, con todo el entorno, el contexto mundial que estamos eh, viviendo, eh, tendemos a, a, a considerarlo un problema y no es un problema. Las migraciones no son un problema, son una oportunidad y esta es la premisa que quiero sentar y sobre la base de esa premisa quiero hablar el resto de mi intervención. Eh, para lograr la plena y efectiva inclusión de los inmigrantes en la sociedad de acogida, su plena autonomía, tenemos que favorecer precisamente eh, ese, ese concepto de que la migración es una oportunidad, porque solo así se producirá el enriquecimiento que realmente eh, produce con su contribución a la eh, sociedad eh, desde un punto de vista económico y cultural. Pero no todo extranjero encuentra facilidades cuando llega a una tierra ajena. Eh, lo cierto es que encuentra barreras administrativas, barreras idiomáticas, barreras culturales y sociales, barreras económicas, barreras educativas, barreras laborales. 
Y todo eso contribuye, entre otras muchas, solo he enumerado algunas, eh, contribuye a que esté en un riesgo de exclusión social. Debemos, pues, desde los poderes públicos abordar políticas para que esto no ocurra. Y lo hacemos, por lo menos es el caso de España, lo abordamos desde dos puntos de vista. Consideramos cuando establecemos las políticas públicas dirigidas a toda la ciudadanía, ya tenemos en cuenta que hay parte de esa ciudadanía que no es nacional y que va a encontrarse esas barreras, pero les, les damos el mismo trato, en pie de igualdad a todos los nacionales. Eso es muy importante porque eh, en materias, por ejemplo, de empleabilidad eh, o, de, o de sanidad, es lo que hace, lo que marca la diferencia y lo que eh, ayuda a su integración en la sociedad y, por consiguiente, contribuye a la cohesión social. Por otro lado, también disponemos de medidas eh, concretas, específicas, dirigidas a los inmigrantes. Está así de manera individualizada y que tienden a salvar otro tipo de barreras, como las habilidades lingüísticas eh, o como eh, la, la situación familiar, favoreciendo la reunificación familiar, de, de, que evidentemente contribuyen decisivamente al proceso de integración o el acceso a la educación de los niños, a veces tratando y dirigiendo um, programas específicos para que eh, conozcan el valor de la escolarización de los niños, que esa educación es un derecho del niño y no solo una obligación de los poderes públicos y de los padres, que es un derecho del niño y solo así ese menor podrá eh, participar del proceso educativo del país e integrarse eh, de una manera absoluta en eh, la sociedad, que además será un vector fundamental para que el resto de la familia acompañe a ese, a ese niño, a ese menor en el proceso de integración que del que se beneficiará toda la familia. En cuanto a los adultos, cada caso merece una atención especial, pero es muy importante comunicar los valores comunes de las sociedades democráticas y nuestras normas de convivencia, esas normas de convivencia que nos hemos dado en, en nuestras sociedades, de manera que eh, promovamos la tolerancia, la igualdad de oportunidades, todo ello que permita la plena integración de las personas migrantes y, por consiguiente, la cohesión social. Sin duda, la adquisición de habilidades de comunicación en el idioma, las costumbres de, del país son eh, tareas fundamentales en ese proceso de integración, porque facilitará el acceso a las posibilidades que brinda la sociedad de acogida. No obstante, hablando de adultos, la integración, eh, el, el elemento fundamental es la empleabilidad, el acceso al mercado laboral. Eh, tenemos, debemos insistir mucho en el reconocimiento de las cualificaciones y de las habilidades no regladas. En este último caso me encantaría quedarme para discutir más, pero realmente es muy importante el, el, el reconocimiento de habilidades que no estén regladas, que no respondan solo a titulaciones de un sistema educativo específico. Otro aspecto clave, por supuesto, es el acceso al sistema sanitario. Lo que es importante es que eh, el conocimiento y el respeto de las normas de convivencia de la sociedad de acogida condicionan buena parte del éxito de integración. Por consiguiente, es importante proporcionar a los recién llegados instrumentos para conocer y aceptar esas normas, porque solo si ocurre esto, si las conocen y las aceptan, eh, continuarán siendo normas comunes a todos y eso favorecerá, evidentemente, la convivencia. ¿Y qué papel puede desempeñar el sector privado en el fortalecimiento de la cohesión social y la promoción de la diversidad? Pues en realidad no solo los poderes públicos eh, contribuyen a, a, a la integración, el conjunto de la sociedad y es fundamental eh, el papel de la sociedad civil, de la academia y de, y de las organizaciones eh, privadas. El mercado de trabajo junto al sistema educativo, he dicho que configuran el mecanismo principal de integración en la sociedad de acogida. Esto hace que las empresas jueguen un papel fundamental como motores de la economía, como motores generadores de empleo. ¿Cómo lo hacen? Pues eh, señalo tres aspectos. Eh, en el ámbito de la sensibilización, la puesta en marcha de proyectos de conocimiento mutuo y valoración de la diversidad en el ámbito de la empresa es fundamental. 
esto es algo que tienen muy asumido grandes empresas en, en sus departamentos de recursos humanos, pero eh, debemos apoyar también desde las administraciones públicas a aquellas otras empresas más pequeñas para eh, que puedan establecer estos eh, espacios de conocimiento mutuo y valoración de la diversidad. Eh, no olvidemos que la diversidad cultural es un patrimonio intangible de la humanidad y así debemos eh, saber transmitirlo. En el ámbito de formación, las empresas también tienen una obligación, no solo desde el ámbito de, este, de su eh, buen gobierno, sino también eh, por su eh, responsabilidad social corporativa. Deben favorecer que todos los trabajadores de las empresas, también los extranjeros, puedan acceder a la formación en, las, en condiciones de igualdad, eliminando obstáculos que pueda tener la persona inmigrante. Y en el ámbito de la política retributiva y de ascensos, también cerciorándose de que directa o indirectamente no se estén aplicando techos de cristal. En España tenemos un observatorio en la Secretaría General de Inmigración, tenemos un observatorio eh, denominado Observatorio Español del Racismo y la Xenofobia y desde este observatorio hemos promovido programas específicos dirigidos a eh, promover eh, las bonanzas de la diversidad cultural en las empresas. Eh, tenemos dos guías específicas eh, que pongo a disposición desde ya para todo aquel que esté interesado y que eh, finalmente coincide en el diagnóstico que en un estudio hizo la Comisión Europea y es eh, en las organizaciones la diversidad cultural, eh, la introducción de la diversidad cultural contribuye al fortalecimiento de los valores de la organización, a la creación de una mejor imagen de la empresa hacia el exterior, a la mejora de la capacidad para atraer y retener talento. Y no olvidemos que hoy estamos en una competencia mundial prácticamente en la atracción y retención del talento. Contribuye igualmente al aumento de la motivación y la eficiencia de los empleados y al incremento de la capacidad de innovación y de la creatividad, porque contamos con personas diferentes, de distintas culturas, que nos enseñan modos diferentes de hacer las cosas. Y eso, nuevamente, significa un enriquecimiento y, por consiguiente, un incremento de la productividad, que es lo que buscan, en definitiva, todas las empresas. Eh, ¿Cuál es el papel de las autoridades locales y los responsables, los responsables de la planificación urbana? Pues el, el papel de las autoridades locales es fundamental porque son los que prestan los servicios generales más próximos al ciudadano, por consiguiente también a las personas extranjeras y probablemente necesiten un refuerzo de manera que puedan articular y configurar servicios para la gestión de la diversidad y, si es necesario, dotándoles de herramientas de acompañamiento y mediación. En España, por ejemplo, las administraciones autonómicas y locales son las encargadas nada menos que de eh, la educación y de la sanidad. Imagínense lo importante que es que tengan este papel. Eh, la cooperación con la sociedad civil, como he citado antes, se torna especialmente necesaria para propiciar el acceso de los inmigrantes a esos servicios generales. Es bueno que desde las administraciones públicas se promueva el asocio asociacionismo, que eh, encuentren las personas extranjeras su propia red social, que no la tienen naturalmente en, el, en la sociedad de acogida. Con, uh, constituyendo asociaciones pueden sustituir esa red social. Y lo mismo cabe decir eh, de la política de vivienda, que también pertenece en España a la competencia de las regiones y entes locales. Eh, y respondiendo a la segunda parte de la, de la pregunta, que es cómo se puede planificar eh, la planificación urbana, el, el, cómo se debe hacer, pues eh, nosotros consideramos que no se, deben, se debe distribuir y dispersar a la población extranjera de manera que no se creen guetos, que no eh, estén todos en el mismo eh, barrio o en, el mismo, o en la misma ciudad. Eh, termino, porque ya me, me piden que termine. Eh, ¿Cómo lograr un cambio en el discurso y la percepción pública negativo sobre la, la, la población migrante? Pues precisamente con esas políticas contra el racismo y la xenofobia. Y, desde, y recomendamos que se haga desde muy temprano en la escuela. Y tenemos programas específicos, igualmente en España, que hemos puesto en marcha, en concreto el proyecto Frida, y ponemos igualmente a disposición que eh, el objetivo es formar y sensibilizar a los docentes.
docentes, responsables de los centros educativos y comunidad educativa en materias fundamentales como los derechos humanos y la prevención y detección del racismo, xenofobia y otras formas conexa y tolerancia. Y sobre todo quiero insistir por último en el papel que juegan los medios de comunicación como creadores y vehículos de opinión. Su implicación en la asunción de códigos de conductas es fundamental, trascendental porque han de mantener un criterio eh, neutral, objetivo y plural para evitar la asociación entre inmigración y conductas reprobables o delictivas. Yo eh, me congratulo de que en España, precisamente por llevar a cabo estas políticas, no tenemos, eh, bueno, considero que no tenemos esos eh, problemas de intolerancia que se están poniendo de manifiesto en otros países. Muchísimas gracias. Agradecemos a la OIM las facilidades que nos ha dado para encontrarnos acá. Asimismo, la amable presentación de Anastasia y pido la comprensión del cuerpo de traductores por la cadencia que deberé imprimir a mi intervención para encontrarme en los tiempos asignados. Tengo el agrado de intervenir en representación del Ecuador en esta nueva etapa del diálogo internacional sobre la migración para participar en una reflexión y un debate constructivo con los actores y las partes interesadas sobre las oportunidades y los desafíos del hecho migratorio. Desde el IDM, con ocasión del 50 aniversario de la OIM en el 2001, hasta el taller que antecedió a este, celebrado el 18 y 19 de abril recién pasados, el Ecuador ha manifestado su amplia apertura a este tipo de procesos que contribuyen a la posterior adopción de políticas migratorias con un enfoque basado en los derechos humanos y el desarrollo. Una relevancia especial en la formulación de las políticas migratorias en el Ecuador tiene su visión sobre un desarrollo no basado exclusivamente en el crecimiento económico, sino en el buen vivir o suma causa y postulado andino reconocido en la Constitución e incorporado en los procesos de planificación local, zonal y nacional y en el de su política exterior. Para el Ecuador, el desarrollo desde esta cosmovisión andina y los derechos humanos son los ejes fundamentales de una política migratoria que permite abordar la multidimensionalidad del hecho migratorio, sus oportunidades y desafíos, entre estos las vulnerabilidades de los migrantes originados por las deficiencias estructurales y la propia naturaleza de los grupos sociales y humanos que protagonizan el hecho migratorio en entornos cada vez más complejos e incluso hostiles, caracterizados por la exclusión en lugar de la inclusión y la discriminación en lugar de la integración. No obstante, la comunidad internacional dispone de valiosos insumos, sin duda, que brindan elementos sustanciales para el propósito de esta reunión. En particular, deben tomarse en cuenta el aporte de las diásporas para atender puentes entre los estados y entre las sociedades, la importancia de la comunicación y divulgación para la elaboración e implementación de políticas y programas que propicien su participación, el desarrollo de un entorno propicio en los países de origen y de destino para acrecentar ese potencial de participación, así como la relevancia de las asociaciones estratégicas entre los países, las organizaciones internacionales, la sociedad civil y el sector privado, con miras a crear un marco generador de la participación de la misma. Además, Debe considerarse el papel de la diáspora durante las situaciones de crisis y después de estas, incluidos los retos globales planteados por la actual movilidad humana sin precedentes, en las que las causas y consecuencias de la migración irregular, estrechamente vinculadas a la agudización de las vulnerabilidades, ameritan respuestas pragmáticas sin dejar de lado los principios y enfoques innegociables como son los derechos humanos y el desarrollo. De igual manera, la declaración del diálogo de alto nivel sobre la migración y el desarrollo, la agenda de desarrollo sostenible y la declaración de Nueva York para los refugiados y los migrantes marcan hitos de enorme trascendencia. Desde esta perspectiva, llamo su atención sobre el contenido del párrafo 29 de la agenda del desarrollo sostenible. En este mismo instrumento se adopta el objetivo 10.7, mediante el cual los Estados nos comprometimos a facilitar la migración y la movilidad ordenadas, seguras, regulares y responsables de las personas, entre otras cosas mediante la aplicación de políticas migratorias planificadas y bien gestionadas, 
No obstante, podemos identificar alrededor de 20 metas adicionales directamente relacionadas con las migraciones. Distinguidas delegaciones, en el primer taller que antecedió a este, el Ecuador esbozó algunas de las prioridades, sobre todo la importancia de alcanzar un enfoque gubernamental integral en materia de migración bajo las distintas perspectivas nacionales y locales, destacando la necesidad de construir una agenda exclusiva sobre movilidad humana y que ésta vaya articulada con los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible de la Agenda 2030. El desafío planteado por el Ecuador al mundo es que se reconozca el aporte cultural, social y económico de las personas migrantes y refugiados en las sociedades de destino, contribuyendo así a la creación de más puentes y menos muros. El Pacto Mundial para una Migración Segura, Regular y Ordenada a adoptarse el próximo año será posible mediante la Unidad de Integración Internacional con el objetivo de lograr un compromiso concreto que garantice la defensa, protección y promoción de los derechos humanos de las personas migrantes con énfasis en los derechos de las mujeres y de los niños y niñas, así como la inclusión, integración recuperación y fortalecimiento de sus capacidades en los países de origen, tránsito y destino. En el Seguro Foro Mundial sobre Migración y Desarrollo, uno de los ejes centrales de los debates fue la responsabilidad compartida, que merece ser invocada una vez más para recordar a la comunidad internacional que es impostergable tomar medidas concertadas y conjuntas con el propósito de garantizar los derechos humanos de las personas migrantes, en particular las mujeres y los niños y niñas, en la coyuntura en la que constatamos asimetrías en la gobernanza migratoria. En el marco del IBDM 2009, se sostuvo que cuando se aborda la cuestión de derechos humanos se hace patente la naturaleza profundamente humana de la migración, que va en contra de la tendencia a considerar a los migrantes como mercancías y a evaluarlos simplemente en términos de su contribución económica a los países de origen y de destino. Y a la fecha, este enfoque político conceptual no ha perdido vigencia. La protección de los derechos humanos de las personas migrantes debe ser un elemento fundamental de la gestión efectiva de la migración y una condición sine qua non para que el hecho migratorio beneficie a las sociedades y a las personas migrantes. En este contexto, un especial esfuerzo requerirá mitigar las vulnerabilidades que pueden originar la exclusión y marginación de las personas migrantes, con la consiguiente vulneración de derechos. Y para ello, el Ecuador considera que los actores claves incluyen a las comunidades locales, en especial en los gobiernos autónomos descentralizados, que bajo la legislación ecuatoriana contribuyen a eliminar las inequidades territoriales. Y, por supuesto, las organizaciones de los migrantes, la diáspora, los gobiernos y el sector privado. Nuestros principios constitucionales de ciudadanía universal, libre movilidad y el fin progresivo de la condición de extranjero son planteamientos mediante los cuales enfrentamos las inequidades y las violaciones de los derechos humanos, incluidos los derechos económicos, sociales, culturales y ambientales. La integración e inclusión social de las personas migrantes debe formar parte de un proceso de doble vía entre las sociedades de acogida y las personas migrantes, por lo que el fomento de programas de integración en los que se destaque la valoración de la diversidad y el respeto a los valores y las normas vigentes de los países de acogida desempeñan un papel fundamental. Los programas de integración, además, deben considerar las necesidades diferenciadas de las personas migrantes, género y edad, entre otras, y las realidades de las comunidades de acogida. Las dimensiones económica, jurídica, social, cultural y religiosa de la integración también son otro elemento fundamental que debe tomarse como referencia a la hora de formular las políticas migratorias. Y un aspecto de significativa relevancia constituye sin duda el diseño e implementación de políticas, planes y programas destinados a acoger a la migración de retorno, sobre la cual el Ecuador tiene valiosas experiencias a compartir, en especial en el fomento de proyectos empresariales y emprendimientos generadores de empleos dignos. Desde esta perspectiva, el Ecuador sostiene como política pública que ningún ser humano es considerado ilegal ni discriminado por su condición migratoria. Reconocemos que las personas tienen el derecho a migrar y a las personas en situación de movilidad humana como sujetos de derechos. Valoramos el papel del sector privado en la dinámica migratoria, en particular en el fomento de la cohesión social y los procesos de integración. 
el sector privado tiene la obligación de respetar los derechos de las personas migrantes y las normas laborales vigentes y deben comprometerse a fomentar y aplicar prácticas no discriminatorias. Es fundamental fomentar la igualdad en el mercado laboral. El Ecuador, como Estado parte de los más importantes tratados de derechos humanos, ha armonizado su legislación nacional con los estándares internacionales y acaba de aprobar una nueva ley orgánica de movilidad humana, en la que se garantiza la igualdad de derechos y deberes a los ecuatorianos e inmigrantes en el territorio nacional y con la cual se eleva normativa las políticas públicas de la Constitución de la República que, estimo, es un referente mundial en el enfoque de los derechos humanos y de la naturaleza. De igual manera, su artículo 167 consigna que todas las entidades del sector público de todos los niveles de gobierno incluirán el enfoque de movilidad humana en las políticas, planes, programas, proyectos y servicios. Un mandato inobjetable. Estamos conscientes, por cierto, que los marcos de gobernanza de la migración se encuentran rezagados ante la dinámica y los desafíos actuales del hecho migratorio. Sin embargo, el Pacto Mundial para una Migración Segura, Regular y Ordenada nos ofrece un momento histórico idóneo para rediseñar la gobernanza migratoria mundial, basada en principios y políticas de inclusión e igualdad de derechos, cuyos ejes deben ser la no criminalización de las personas migrantes, la valoración de los aportes positivos de las personas migrantes en los países de origen y destino y la prevención y abordaje de la xenofobia y otras formas de intolerancia y discriminación. Muchas gracias, señoras y señores. On behalf of the government of Kazakhstan, I would like to, thanks, uh, to say thanks to IOM for partnership and effective cooperation uh, in, sustain in contribution into sustainable development of Kazakhstan Central Asia. My organization is a partner of IOM in Kazakhstan, and we did a very effective report called as Migration Vulnerabilities and Integration Needs in Central Asia. Today we finished the second phase of the report. So I'd love to just share with you some briefs of that. Just a few words about Central Asia and why, why it matters. Uh, the small region but it date has very huge uh, geopolitical and geoeconomical uh, impact into development of Eurasia. And migration plays a very sensitive and significant role in current sustainability of the region. Just some figures. Central Asia's population is about 67 millions of people, and about 10 or 11 millions of them must annually leave own home, homes to seek for jobs and earn for living or money for living abroad, uh, overseas. This critical factor for sustainability and development of the region. 11 million, almost fifth part of the region, are on the move. These people uh, go to Russia, Turkey, South Korea, United uh, Emirates, and EDC. Uh, the migrants themselves are vulnerable due to current economic uh, dynamic in some of recipient countries around Central Asia and uncertain status itself of them. So there is a direct strong link between radicalization and uh, migration, especially when basic rights and needs of migrants are not provided. Uh, a number of Central Asian migrants, due to their vulnerabilities and illegal status, uh, sometimes happen there, the participants or pot potential participants uh, in the world known extremist and radical movements and foreign fighters in military conflicts. For example, there are traces in Syria and Afghanistan. Uh, it's a very important issue for my country, being the recipient of these uh, migration flows. Due, pro due to progressive economic development of Kazakhstan, uh, we became a recipient of labor migration from Central Asia, uh, as it really can affect uh, our sustainability and security. That's why we need to, uh, we face the need to integrate these people into our society. That's why Kazakhstan, in partnership with IOM, several years ago launched the Almaty process that helped us to solve issues in regional migration. According to the agenda we have today on IMD, I would like just briefly to say some practices and results of our policy and cooperation. The first, recognition of migration on policy level with certain strategic programming of public administration and legislation support is significant. And other part of it, partner network to build social infrastructure for migrants' integration. 
It allows to give migrants understanding that they are welcomed and uh, there are some certain options for their legal stay, stay and activity in the recipient country. It decreases the set of options for illegal manipulations with people by criminal groups or corrupted officials. It helps correctly to involve NGOs and ethnic diasporas in regulation of migration, decrease challenges and receive bigger economic effect. The second, our findings show that foreign migrants who know local languages and have ethnic diasporas in Kazakhstan are better adaptable and easier integrated in local societies. Language can help to use professional skills and find better jobs and service areas where communication is needed. Diasporas can assist to find jobs, uh, solve issues with documents or communicate with employees, uh, employers or local authorities. That's why uh, Kazakhstan became very attractive uh, for people from the, our neighborhood, from Central Asia, because we don't have language, culture, religion issues. Our government with IOM closely work together with ethnic diasporas as with partners who can help to facilitate migration issues and softly integrate newcomers. Third, to control national, regional, territorial distribution and balanced concentration of labor force among the regions in the country of origin. It helps to use migration as a real tool of economic development according to the needs of certain regions. Planning helps to avoid over-concentration of migrants in certain regions and to avoid conflicts with local and local, mar uh, local markets. That's why Kazakhstan does today using IOM's data. We try to relocate migrants from south to north and west regions. Those are less populated and need more work in hands. New concept for migration policy sets certain planning requirements for government and local authorities. Fourth, we need to provide clear and open process starting from the country of origin. Uh, on information level, the embassies and IOM missions in the countries of origin should provide the information about the first preparations and steps from crossing the border to registration as taxpayer and meeting with employer. Before crossing the border, potential migrant must know own rights in the recipient country and know must do steps on arrival. Trainings for governmental agencies, local authorities are very important to provide understanding and professional skills to operate the migration processes. That's why we try to do that's what we try to do today in Kazakhstan in cooperation with IOM. Fifth, I would, I would like to underline the role of proper informational coverage uh, of migration in mass media and the image they create for migrants. Mostly only the professionals know about the impact of labor, uh, migrants and national economy. In common, the public doesn't have the real picture uh, about uh, migration. In Kazakhstan, IOM office regularly launches the comp uh, competitions among the journalists for the best publication on positive effect of migration. It covers unknown issues about migrants and motivates media uh, community to pay attention to the phenomena. Thus, Kazakhstan welcomes IOM activity. We see real social results and posi positive policy impact. In addition, this year, Kazakhstan granted a certain sum of uh, money to IOM's activity to continue research findings on migrants' vulnerabilities and rights. So one more time, thank you to Aya. I'd like to start off by thanking the IOM. I'd also like to thank the honoured delegates and the distinguished panellists. Um, today is a particular honour for me because, as has already been mentioned, I arrived in the UK aged two as a refugee from Somalia uh, with my father. Um, and I feel that the issues that we're discussing today are perhaps relevant to me as a politician, but then they're also very relevant to me uh, as a person. So without further ado, um, I'd like to kick off to the second slide. Now, I'm sure you're all aware of Brexit and uh, Britain's decision to leave the European <laughs> Union. Um, Fortunately, Bristol was one of the cities that, remain, that voted to remain within the European Union. Uh, the, vote leave, uh, the vote leave result in Bristol was only 38%. So the majority of people in Bristol, to the tune of 61.7% of Bristolians, voted to remain within the European Union. Bristol is the largest city outside, within the southwest region with 450,000 people living there. At least 45 religions are practiced, 187 countries represented by birth, and a staggering 91 main languages spoken in the city of Bristol. Bristol has a relatively young age profile with more children aged between 0 and 15 uh, as compared to people over the age of 65. 
International immigration peaked in the city of Bristol in 2004 and 2005. Births are actually now the main driver of population growth. Migrants are concentrated within the inner city wards, and I don't know if you uh, have this slide, but um, I represent the ward of Lawrence Hill, which is situated within the inner city of Bristol. Uh, until very recently, I represented 20,000 uh, people. The, the ward was actually redrawn, and I now represent just over 10,000 people. So that gives you an idea of the sort of inequality that people from migrant backgrounds may face when it comes to where in the city they actually live. As I've said, we have a lot of people living in Bristol who are not originally from the UK. Um, the following slide gives you an indication of where those people come from, with some of our highest uh, diaspora communities coming from Poland, Somalia, India, Jamaica, Pakistan, Germany, China, France, the USA, Italy, Nigeria and Spain. In terms of prosperity, it's no secret that Bristol is one of the um, most successful cities in Europe in attracting inward investment. We also have the second highest number of business startups in the entire country. We have a staggering 71% employment as opposed to 7% unemployment. We are globally recognized as having clusters of aerospace. I'm sure you're all aware of the, the long and proud history that Bristol has with Concord. We also have Airbus stationed uh, in the city of Bristol. We also have high-tech creative digital economies as well as low-carbon technologies, financial and professional services. Economic inclusion. The University of the West of England, which is situated in Bristol, did a study recently uh, and highlighted the key areas of improvement for the city of Bristol being around the need to work, uh, seek investment to work with employers and also tackle barriers to the labour market, not just for the migrant populations, but also uh, for those members of the host community who perhaps didn't have the educational opportunities uh, when they were younger. Vulnerable groups, this gives you an idea of what Bristol is, um, what the sort of situation that Bristol is facing with regards to migrants or refugees or peoples from other countries. We have 800 asylum seekers in Bristol, we have 250 refugees each year. We have 100 people at the moment on the Syrian resettlement scheme. I personally believe that the UK ought to have more than that. Uh, and my political party, the Labour Party, is too of that opinion. But at the moment, we have 100 people on the Syrian resettlement scheme. We have 71 unaccompanied asylum-seeking children also in the city of Bristol. 30% of women using Refugee Women of Bristol drop-in, which is a, a service funded by the local council but delivered by voluntary sector organisations, uh, live in the UK for five years or more, are still in need of further assistance. At least 663 non-UK rough sleepers are in Bristol. In terms of health, I heard it mentioned here yesterday that um, access to health is of a particular concern for people from migrant backgrounds. I was particularly touched by the statement um, made which explained how vulnerable migrant, female migrants when they are pregnant are unable or perhaps unwilling to seek the medical uh, services in the host countries in the form that they are provided in. In Bristol, we've come up with a very unique tailored and special way to ensure that migrant uh, members of the migrant communities are able to access that support. The Haven Health Clinic is a special clinic run by GPs, nurses, who offer a service adjusted to better meet the needs of asylum seekers and refugees joining their families and unaccompanied asylum seekers uh, and children as well as victims of human trafficking. 
we have a coordinated community response. We are so lucky in the city of Bristol to have a population which is both determined and able to assist those uh, from other countries who find themselves in Bristol. We have four drop-in refugee welcome centres, one for women only, two hot lunch homeless centres, which are funded by the EU, 100 units of accommodation for new refugees. Every new refugee has a designated caseworker. 30 households give a room to destitute asylum seekers on a long-term basis. 150 offer a room on a short-term basis. There is a free shop for refugees. This basically comprises of uh, Bristolians putting together uh, products which are still very usable, but perhaps uh, they don't need them anymore. Trafficking victims, male safe house and women only safe house in Bristol. 1,100 students each year at college studying English as another language, as well as 80 community English classes each week. And I really want to stress the importance of having community-based provision for adults to ensure that actually the ESOL, English as an additional language provision, doesn't happen in some of the more formal contexts such as colleges, which may well be intimidating to people, but they actually happen where people live in a uh, friendly and accessible environment. To continue with the sort of voluntary support that we give, um, here are a range, I won't read them all out, but the sort of thing we provide are advocacy. So we have students from the University of Bristol coming along to ensure that actually migrants who don't have access to lawyers have access to lawyers and ensure that they have advocacy uh, at their service. Cross-cultural understanding, very important. Reading practice, very important. Health checks, very important. Crash to ensure that people are able to seek out those employment opportunities as well as educational opportunities. We have a free barber uh, service because, of course, the way you look is all uh, part and parcel of your confidence. And we're, in, we're absolutely making sure that we're able to cater to the needs of migrants from the very specific things such as personal appearance but also in terms of long-term aspirations. We have a lot of migrants with qualifications in the UK but perhaps those qualifications aren't translated over. We're ensuring that we're giving those people the support to be able to continue their life here. Promoting inclusion, we're very proud to have been uh, given the City of Sanctuary status in 2011. We are still a City of Sanctuary and that is something that we're very proud of. 2015, the Rockefeller Resilient City Award. 2016, research into support. Uh, we did some research into supporting the needs of economic migrants. That work is ongoing. 2017, inclusive cities. 2017, welcoming asylum seekers and refugees needs assessment strategy and action plan. That work is currently underway. <coughs> The sorts of projects that we funded in 2017 include Vision Values, Bristol ESOL for Living Together project, Employment Navigator for Migrants, Rough Sleeping and Returning Home, as well as Specialist Leader in Education for Early Years to ensure that children coming to Bristol are able to get that support right at the very, very beginning. Last but not least, measuring inclusion in an annual quality of life survey the um, respondents who agreed from people living in, from different backgrounds get on well together has risen from 58% in 2010 to 63% in 2015. I say all of this to say that we have uh, people of migrant, economic migrant backgrounds in Bristol. We also have people who are of refugee backgrounds in Bristol. The reason we've been able to make a success of the uh, the challenges that we face is because we have an able population which is willing to open the doors, which is willing to ensure that the city of Bristol remains a global, international city which is opening its doors. To put it simply, we understand the economic benefit of having migrants in our workforce. We understand the cultural benefit of having migrants as part of our population in the city of Bristol. What we're here to do today is ensure that the City of Bristol remains on all of your agendas, irrespective of Brexit. We are an international city and we very much look forward to working with you all much more closely. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much for the introduction.
and thank you to the IOM IOM for this incredible honor of being here. As mentioned, I'm a documentary filmmaker in the United States making films about sustainable food around the world, traveling to Ethiopia and Mexico, um, China and Sri Lanka to tell the stories behind our, where our food comes from. Um, I was all set to continue that process, and, uh, but we had a tumultuous election year in the United States and um, saw a lot of change or at least a, a broad um, certain attitudes coming to light around migrants, particularly uh, Mexican undocumented people in the United States and Muslim migrants. Um, and it was, it was very concerning. I, I was surprised and shocked by how I had such positive experiences with migrants in the, in the United States, including my neighbors, while there was a whole uh, part of society that was um, that felt differently and where we were seeing a, a dramatic ri rise in hate crimes and in language that was xenophobic. Um, as a citizen and a filmmaker and a neighbor, I was left wondering what I could do about it. Um, and I began to look into how this kind of thing happened. And, and I stumbled upon an article in the Wall Street Journal that showed the Facebook feeds of conservative and liberals in the United States. And the, the results of it are, are shocking. We're receiving two completely different sets of news um, that, that don't, even, don't even start in the same place. So how, how can we have a dialogue in the United States if we're not receiving the same set of news? Um, one side being over, overwhelmingly negative narratives about, about migrants. And uh, at the same time as this was happening, I was experimenting with Facebook and doing targeted marketing of my own um, videos about, about food and having a lot of success with reaching different groups of people. So I, I began to wonder what I could do about the, the, the situation in the US and how I could get the stories out, because I knew that the stories have an incredible power of bringing people and connecting people in a way that, uh, with people that they don't know. And so I... Uh, came up with, with the idea of using targeted Facebook marketing to reach across the aisle. And instead of just preaching to the choir and showing a film at a film festival about an inspiring migrant story, instead looking to tell stories about how, we're, how we are all, all common and the things we have uh, that are similar. Things like uh, family values, eating food together, um, and and uh, being loyal. And so we, we launched a Kickstarter campaign and got overwhelming support, um, raising our, our, the amount of funds that we had in order to make uh, five short films. So we're in the process of doing that and, uh, and finding a way to get these films in front of a new audience. And to, I've heard a lot of talk about you know, public policy over the course of this, uh, of this conference. And public policy needs public support. And so how do you get? one side of the audience to support the kind of positive migrant um, uh, opportunities that, that you all are speaking about. So I want to um, show you a film, or the first films that we've, we're in the process of still editing and still filming, but it shows an undocumented um, Mexican migrant in the United States who calls, while, while she's still undocumented, has lived here there for 23 years. So it's an it's a interesting story about the vulnerabilities, but also the hope that is possible for, for migrants in the US. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel, and thank you again to all of the contributors who have raised a number of the dimensions of integration and inclusion that I think will be very useful for our continued discussion, although we don't have as much time for it as I would like. Um, the floor is now open for contributions, and I would like to start, I think, with the Holy See. Thank you, Madam Chair. While stressing the need for the integration of migrants and host countries, Pope Francis explained that this is neither assimilation nor incorporation. It is a two-way process, rooted essentially in the joint recognition of the other's cultural richness. In this two-way process, migrants are not are due to bound not to close themselves off from the culture and tradition of the receiving country, respecting above all its laws. Receiving states, on the other hand, must respect the family dimension of the process of integration, shaping policies directed at favoring and benefiting the reunion of the family, the fundamental unit of society. Madam Chair, 
there cannot be successful and sustainable immigration policy without a simultaneous, comprehensive, and mutual enriching integration strategy centered on the human person as the subject of the, its primary responsible for development. The engagement of local administrations in fostering a culture of integration, mutual, enri mutual enrichment, and peace will be fundamental. In this regard, Madam Chair, if you allow me to inform the distinguished representative and in attendance that during the upcoming session of IOM's Council in November, the permanent mission of the Holy See, together with some other organizations, is preparing a high-level event that aims to present good practices and to identify practical recommendations to improve the integration of migrants in host societies. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. I, I now turn to the Philippines. The Philippines would like to share its experience on providing information to its migrant workers, starting from uh, the pre-departure uh, to post-arrival, stay and return, and reintegration. Mm -hmm. The Philippines believes that providing the migrant with proper information is a source of empowerment and therefore reduces or mitigates uh, vulnerabilities of the migrant, him or herself, or the situation that he or she is in. Uh, for this reason, uh, we have developed what you call a comprehensive information uh, program, which is being pilot tested in the uh, Abu Dhabi dialogue as a best practice. I would like to ask uh, any of the panelists, since we are discussing now social uh, integration, whether the destination country has a, a post-arrival orientation uh, or education for, for, for migrants, whether at the enterprise or employer level, the local government level, or uh, at any level being provided by the national uh, government. And if there is, uh, can you please provide a brief uh, description of this uh, post-arrival orientation? Thank you. Thank you very much. Argentina. Muchas gracias, señora moderadora. La Argentina entiende que las políticas migratorias deben tender a la inclusión de los migrantes en las sociedades de acogida mediante marcos normativos que garanticen el acceso de los migrantes a la educación, a la salud y a los servicios sociales en condiciones de igualdad con los nacionales y con independencia de su situación migratoria. Es importante destacar el rol que tienen las comunidades locales y el sector privado en el proceso de integración y de elaboración de las políticas migratorias. Nuestro país continúa comprometido con la labor de la OIM en la defensa de los derechos de las personas migrantes. En particular, quisiéramos destacar los recientes esfuerzos llevados adelante por la Argentina en la promoción de la salud de los migrantes y refugiados en el marco del proceso de elaboración del Pacto Mundial sobre una Migración Ordenada, Segura y Regular, y en el ámbito de la Organización Mundial de la Salud, entre otros. Creemos que la Agenda 2030 para el Desarrollo Sostenible y el Pacto Mundial sobre Migración, entre otros, representan importantes marcos de acción para promover políticas públicas activas de integración de los migrantes y que reconozcan que el nexo entre migración y desarrollo supera el mero aspecto económico, incluyendo una perspectiva humana, social y cultural. Thank you very much. Morocco to be followed by Denmark. Merci, Madame la Moderatrice. La politique migratoire au Maroc procède d'une approche globale et humaniste axée sur l'intégration des migrants dans le tissu socio-économique. Après les deux grandes vagues de régularisation des migrants, Euh, sous les hautes directives de Sa Majesté le Roi Mohamed VI, des, des programmes ayant notamment trait à l'éducation, à la formation professionnelle, à l'emploi, au logement et à la santé leur sont dédiés. La stratégie marocaine d'immigration et d'asile s'était fixée, autre, autre objectif, entre autres objectifs, la facilitation de l'intégration dans les tissus économiques et sociaux marocains des migrants réguliers et de leur accès aux mêmes droits que les Marocains. L'insertion passe en premier lieu par l'éducation. La scolarisation est, en effet, l'un des éléments clés de la réussite de la politique migratoire. Au même titre que les Marocains, les enfants des migrants, peu importe leur statut, ont accès à l'école marocaine et bénéficient de l'appui social sco scolaire ainsi que les cantines et internats scolaires. Au niveau de l'emploi, des initiatives ont été menées en vue de faciliter l'accès des jeunes migrants au système de formation professionnelle. De même, la préférence nationale a été supprimée. 
les migrants bénéficient, au même titre que les Marocains, des services de recherche d'emploi. Outre l'éducation et l'emploi, un programme portant sur le logement a été lancé au profit des migrants, en particulier ceux à faible revenu, à travers leur intég intégration dans les programmes de logements sociaux et économiques subventionnés par l'État marocain et la facilitation de leur accès aux prêts immobiliers. Dans le domaine de la santé, les migrants bénéficient d'une couverture médicale de base dans les mêmes conditions que les citoyens marocains. Enfin, le Royaume du Maroc se félicite de la coopération existante entre les autorités marocaines et l'OIM autour de la question migratoire et prêt à partager ses bonnes pratiques avec d'autres pays dans le cadre de coopération bilatérale axée sur la migration. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, Morocco. I now turn to Denmark to be followed by Belgium. Denmark refers to the statement to be delivered on behalf of the EU and its member states. Denmark places great emphasis on integration and social inclusions for migrants legally staying in Denmark, and self-sufficiency through employment is the principal target of the Danish integration effort. Pursuant to the Danish Integration Act, responsible local authorities must offer an integration program to newly arrived refugees, to persons granted legal stay due to humanitarian reasons, to foreigners <coughs> arrived under family reunification schemes, etc. These integration programs can last up to five years. The integration program consists of job training and Danish language courses. Other regular migrants, such as labor immigrants and their families and students, can be offered an introduction course, which is a lighter version of the integration program, but the introduction course can also consist of job training and Danish language courses. We strongly believe that everybody capable of working should work. Experience shows that practical labor market experience is the most efficient path to obtaining regular employment and integration in general. This was also emphasized by several of the panelists. However, some newly arrived migrants do not possess the skills and productivity required to qualify for a job at a regular high Danish wage. The Danish government has therefore already launched a number of in activities, initiatives to prove, improve employment and integration records. Last year, the government concluded talks with the employers, employees and local authorities organizations involving further initiatives aiming at improving cost effectiveness and strengthening the outcome of employment and integration programs. Over the past two years, the key indicators of bringing newly arrived into work have improved significantly. I would like to end our interve intervention by stressing that we are doing all we can to ensure a successful integration and social inclusion of all migrants legally staying in Denmark. At the same time, we must recognize that when it comes to migrants without legal stay, the solution is a dignified return to the country of origin or first country of asylum. Thank you. Belgium. Oui, merci, Madame la Présidente. Je voulais simplement attirer l'attention de l'Assemblée sur une réunion qui se tiendra les 16 et 17 novembre à Malines, une ville en Belgique, euh, sur l'intégration et la migration. Pourquoi Malines Parce que le bourgmestre de Malines, M. Bart Somers, avait été euh, désigné ou a été désigné comme le meilleur maire du monde, si on peut dire, euh, en ce qui concerne la euh, migration et l'intégration. Et l'exemple de Malines euh, ressemble beaucoup à celui qu'on nous a expliqué sur Bristol, sur la ville de Bristol. Le grand principe de Malines, c'est qu'on est citoyen de la ville, indépendamment de sa nationalité ou de son origine. Ceci implique un accès égal au marché du travail, à l'éducation, à la santé publique. Ça implique également aussi l'acceptation des règles, le respect de la loi, également, également en ce qui concerne la migration illégale. Alors, euh, le refus du communautarisme, c'est aussi le refus de la ghettoisation, donc l'accès égal à tous les quartiers pour le logement. Euh, cela implique aussi euh, une mobilité sociale, l'appui de la communauté locale avec un système de tutorship ou de, euh, euh, donc de groupement de citoyens originaires de la ville qui accompagnent les nouveaux arrivants pour l'apprentissage de la langue et toutes les démarches administratives. Cela implique aussi, évidemment... Euh, tout en refusant la ghettoisation et la communautarisme, euh, l'acceptation d'une diversité culturelle très importante et un changement de narratif sur la ville qui n'est pas présenté selon ses problèmes de migration, mais plutôt tout ce que la migration peut apporter au domaine de son expansion économique et autres. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Belgium. Sierra Leone to be followed by the European Union. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And let me also thank the panelists. My question particularly is for the two people who demonstrated the slides, the councillor and the last person. I watched the slides 
very, very attentively. I did not see anything pertaining to the housing facilities for the migrants. The last slide, the lady clearly states that she was driving, but without a driving license. And that's one of the biggest problems that migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers have when they live in other countries. I used to work for International Rescue Committee. I worked for Catholic Charities. And these migrants would drive without driving license. The police would stop them, and then they would come running to the office. So your organizations, what are you doing in helping these migrants to seek their driving license? And also, what are you doing regarding their housing facilities? Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I go to the European Union, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. I recognizing that integration is a dynamic two-way process of mutual accommodation by all migrants and citizens of member states, we should promote the social and economic inclusion of migrants who are legally staying in host societies. We also need to promote inclusion and support of legally staying migrants in transit countries. Integration cannot succeed if each actor concerned works in isolation. Only the mobilization and cooperation of public authorities at international, national, regional, and local levels, employers, chambers of commerce, trade unions, NGOs, and the private sector can improve integration outcomes of newcomers who are facing numerous challenges when it comes to their integration in the labor market, including, in particular, language barriers, recognition of skills, and discrimination. In line with the constant reminder by IOM's Director General Swing, we recognize that a positive narrative of migration and migrants may enable better integration into societies and may lead to a more fruitful use of migrant capacities in our civil and economic community. The European Commission on the Integration of Third Country Nationals, which includes 50 concrete actions that the Commission is putting in place to support member states and other actors in their integration efforts. Labour market integration and social inclusion are two of the five priority areas of this action plan. The EU also supports social inclusion through various European structural and investment funds. We need to address practical barriers to integration, in particular tackling skills recognition and language courses for legally staying migrants. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can we go directly, please, to Kenya? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the question of migration actually incites similar controversies as the movement of goods and services, which is a recurring debate at WTO. We recognize that majority of migrants move in order to improve their economic well-being, but the integration becomes very difficult because of lack of skills required in the countries of destination. In this regard, most highly skilled uh, personnel move to the developed economies uh, this category of migrants have been trained and developed uh, by at the cost of government or family meager resources. Uh, some families even sell their only earthly possession to give training to their children. But these are the people who move abroad and saturate uh, the labor market of the developed countries instead of coming back and leaving their countries worse off uh, than they left it. I believe that the solution to this is that countries need to cooperate to correct the democrat democratic the democratic the demographic imbalance that exists between the industrial north and the agrarian south, and so that these skills should be developed. States should cooperate to develop these skills and labor need gaps. 
Let the developed North move and develop these skills at the source so that when they move out there, it is easy to integrate them in the society. A response is like uh, Brexit. Sorry, can I, can I ask you to finish, please, because there are a number of other speakers. I'm very, very sorry. There are a number of other speakers. So could I ask you to finish up, if possible, please? Just concluding, Madam Chair. Responses like Brexit and mass expulsion of migrants are like doctors misdiagnosing the disease and treating the symptoms rather than the disease. I want to end there. Thank you. Kenya. Now, one minute, please, from Patriotic Vision to be followed by Mexico and then the USA. Shukran, Hadat Raisa. من خلال خبراتنا عن موضوع الهجرة والإدماج الاجتماعي داخل منظمتنا العالمية أن الهجرة القصرية أو الجماعية الطوعية ودخول مجموعات بشرية إلى وطن ما وإن كان من نفس اللون أو الدين أو الجنس أو اللغة لابد أن يساهم في خلق أزمات ويحدث نوع من أنواع الضغوط على البلد المضيف حيث تضاعف الحاجة إلى المرافق الاجتماعية العامة كالمياه والكهرباء والصرف الصحي والخدمات الأخرى وينعكس وجود المهاجرين أو النازحين في البلد المقيم سلبا على الأوضاع الاقتصادية بل تزيدها السوء على المستويين الوطني والمحلي وتطال هذه الأزمات الوضع الأمني وتطرأ أزمات اجتماعية وسياسية لكن ما يحصل غالبا في بداية الأزمة هو رحابة صدر المقيمين والتعاطف الإنساني مع المهاجرين لكن مع مرور الزمن يتحول وجودهم إلى مشاكل تهدد قدرة المقيمين على الصمود والتحمل فتظهر حالة من التوتر والاحتكاك السلبي ما بين المواطن والمهاجر من جراء البطالة في صفوف النساء والشباب الناتجة عن المزاحمة في سوق العمل وبسبب العمالة متدنية الأجر للنازحين والمضاربة أيضا في سوق العمل فنعتقد أن على المجتمع الدولي والمنظمات العالمية دعم المواطن الدول المضيفة للمهاجرين أو النازحين كدعم في المياه والكهرباء ومشاريع البنى التحتية والتعليم والطبابة كما وأن توفير الخدمات الإنسانية وتحقيق الاستقرار والاندماج الاجتماعي من خلال مشاريع تنموية تعوب بالإفادة على المضيف والنازح من شأنه المساهمة في التخفيف في حدة التوتر والدمج الاجتماعي ويحقق من خلال قلق فرص عمل ومشاريع ترفع أزمة النازحين عن كاهل الوطن المضيف وخاصة أنه يعاني أصلا من أزمات البطالة والهجرة والشابة Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I now turn to Mexico to be followed by the USA. Muchas gracias. Eh, compartir que una de las prioridades de México ha sido el empoderamiento de los migrantes mexicanos en el exterior como herramienta para fortalecer su capacidad de influencia, de influencia, facilitar su integración y potenciar sus contribuciones a las sociedades donde viven. A través de nuestra red de consulados eh, realizamos esfuerzos permanentes de diálogo y coordinación con autoridades locales para sensibilizarlas sobre las características y necesidades específicas. En los últimos años, como resultado de nuevas realidades del fenómeno migratorio, mi país ha diversificado sus políticas de protección preventiva. Déjenme citar dos ejemplos. Uno es lo que denominamos la Semana Binacional de Salud, que se ha convertido realmente en un mes, y la segunda, las ventani eh, la Semana de Derechos Laborales, que, son, que tienen la función de informar a los migrantes sobre sus derechos. Finalmente, destacar que en este esfuerzo, señora moderadora, estimados colegas, vamos de la mano con los gobiernos con los, eh, de las naciones de Centroamérica en una estrategia integral. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. USA. Thank you, Madam Moderator. The human rights and fundamental freedoms of all individuals, regardless of their migration status, should be respected. The United States the United States takes this responsibility very seriously and we urge other states to do so. We condemn unlawful discrimination against migrants, regular or irregular. States should encourage efforts by local governments, civil society and the private sector to discourage xenophobia and intolerance against migrants and combat discrimination. The panelists this morning have all discussed the importance of such efforts and Mr. Klein has generously showed us a, practical, a very practical example of this. Two final points. It is important to look at social inclusion and cohesion through a development lens. Investing in countries of origin, transit, and destination by supporting development projects that are cross-sectoral in nature and take into account issues of livelihood, education, and health, with a focus on integration of migrant and host communities, can help address vulnerabilities and protection issues. 
Government and other stakeholders should engage in development activities that support longer-term consideration of refugee and migrant populations in host country development planning and budgeting processes through development assistance programs and dialogues. Thank you very much. Sorry, I, then I, go to, I go to Libya. Thank you very much. Social inclusion can only be applied in the country of destination, cannot be implied in the country uh, of transit. Uh, this has to be uh, really understood because it, I heard it many times. There is one thing that I, we have learned uh, from our European partners that we should respect, as we respect the human rights, we should respect the rule of law. And the rule of law, I believe that irregular migration is breaking the rule of law. And we heard that when they, when they talk about social inclusion in the countries of destination, they use the term legal stay. But when they talk about transit, they don't use, they don't use this kind of term. So I, I think we should talk about our own governments and what they could do what we could, and what they could not do without teaching lessons to others. Thank you. Thank you very much. UK to be followed by Guatemala. Thank you. Um, and first of all, the UK would like to align itself with the statement by, made by the EU on behalf of itself and its member states. Uh, I'd also like to thank Councillor Jamar, because she did an excellent job of giving us a really good view of how her city works hard to go about integrating migrants. And I think, as our migration envoy pointed out yesterday for the UK, that integration is a really key part of helping to address and reduce vulnerability of migrants. Um, some of that work is, of course, supported by the central government. Uh, as the councillor referred to in one of her slides, I think, each local authority region with that support has a strategic migration partnership that provides coordination and support services to the organisations working with migration, migrants. These organizations include local government authorities, civil society, and volunteers, and I think the slide really showed that really well. Um, and as Councillor Jamar eloquently demonstrated, the people of the UK work really hard to support the migrants that come to our shores. We have a long history and con will continue to welcome migrants to the United Kingdom. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally to Guatemala, after which I'm going to turn only to the two colleagues on the platform to whom questions have been addressed. Gracias, señora moderadora. Consideramos que la mejor respuesta para la integración y la inclusión social es el trabajo. En muchos casos, el acceso al mercado laboral, así como los servicios básicos tales como salud y educación, está limitado según el estatus migratorio de la persona, por lo que se hace necesario revisar estos marcos normativos nacionales. Guatemala desde hace algunos años se enfrenta al desafío de recibir un alto número de guatemaltecos retornados. En ese sentido, recientemente ha lanzado un proyecto llamado Guatemala te incluye. Su objetivo es contribuir a la integración de la población migrante deportada en el mercado laboral y la economía local de Guatemala. Este proyecto incluye alianzas estratégicas con el sector público, gobiernos locales, sector privado, así como la sociedad civil y organismos internacionales. Se realiza un proceso de evaluación y acreditación de competencias, se brinda orientación laboral y se vincula la oferta y la demanda a través de aliados y socios del sector público-privado. Asimismo, se dan microcréditos para iniciar negocios eh, propios y orientación laboral. En, en relación a lo que mencionaba el delegado de México, resaltar también que en el tema de la protección eh, consular y orientación hemos estado trabajando conjuntamente para orientar a, a nuestros nacionales en, en diversos temas, lo que, cual consideramos una, una buena iniciativa. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Bolivia, you have 50 seconds or 30. Callaya, hermana moderadora, agradecemos la convocatoria al presente diálogo y asimismo a los panelistas. Los movimientos sociales y ciudadanos y ciudadanas del mundo se reunieron en Bolivia los días 20 y 21 de junio del 2017 en torno a la Conferencia Mundial de los Pueblos por un mundo sin muros hacia la ciudadanía universal. 
evento en el que se escucharon testimonios de migrantes y refugiados. Se debatió colectivamente desde la memoria histórica y la pluralidad de las identidades, dando lugar a una declaración ante los estados y la comunidad internacional con relación a la crisis migratoria. Queremos compartir que en este diálogo internacional algunas propuestas se aceptaron de pleno consenso. Una, promover políticas migratorias desde la visión humanista que permita acoger, proteger, promover e integrar a las personas migrantes. Rechazar la criminalización de la migración que encubre falsos enfoques de seguridad y control. De manera particular, exigimos la eliminación de los centros de detención de migrantes. Crear una Defensoría Mundial de los Pueblos por los Derechos de las Personas Migrantes, Refugiados, Asilados, Apátridas, Víctimas de Trata y Tráfico. Superar el enfoque de fronteras rígidas por una visión que las entienda como puentes de integración para la unidad entre los pueblos. Estas son algunas de las conclusiones arribadas. Gracias. Thank you, Bolivia, and I now turn to my two colleagues. Sorry, friends, the rest of you, that there will not be time for you, to Hibak and to Daniel. So we could start maybe with Hibak. Thank you. Um, just to give a really practical example of the sorts of things that we uh, support migrants with, with regards to employment, I think this question was asked earlier on, um, not quite sure by whom. Um, the answer is, I think we do a great job. There's always room for improvement, and I think um, there's always a, a room for us to challenge ourselves in terms of how much better we can do. But for now, we've been very successful in supporting refugee women to set up a catering business, providing the seed money, providing the business knowledge and uh, the support. We've also been very successful in supporting young men of refugee backgrounds uh, to start a social enterprise around football and sports and I'm pleased to see Australia uh, in the room although no one's quite there at the moment but these young men are looking at what they can do to garner the athletic skill within the community to ensure that people from migrant backgrounds are not overlooked just because they don't have the connections in the world to support them to make their dreams come true. And we have an awful lot of young men who, um, like much of the world, enjoy sports. And it would be a shame for us to, as a local authority, not, suppose though, not support those young men either financially or through the business support. Um, that's been successful and I know that they're looking to place uh, uh, one particular football player from my ward that I'm very proud of uh, in Australia and I know that piece of work is is ongoing so as I said there's always room for improvement but those are two very real practical examples of, of where we have been able to support migrants in accessing the uh, employment market I think that's, that's it. thank you thank you very much Daniel just very quickly just very quickly in regards to the question about um, the driver's license and the woman in the, in the film, um, she is actively advocating for uh, a change in the law in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, it was not passed, the proposition that of, during the last voting session. Um, it's, she, she states the fact that it is a reality that migrants are going to drive, and so to ignore it and not let them drive legally uh, causes a lot of issues related to insurance and accidents. One incredible example of the resilience of the migrant community, particularly Mexican, in the United States is they're uh, working together. And she actually, her car is owned by someone else um, who does have uh, citizenship and is able to purchase license for the car so that if there is an accident, that people are covered. Thank you very much. Ambassador has asked for 30 seconds to respond to the Philippines, I think. Eh, gracias, Anastasia. Me refiero a una pregunta formulada respecto de la integración social en el país de acogida luego de la llegada del migrante. En base a la Constitución ecuatoriana, se ha implementado una política pública que otorga iguales derechos y beneficios a los nacionales y extranjeros, estableciendo inclusive acción afirmativa en favor de las personas en movilidad humana. Y en el caso de los municipios o gobiernos descentralizados se está implementando el denominado sello de movilidad humana para aquellos que han acogido a un determinado número de migrantes. Gracias. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for all of your questions and interventions from the floor, but particular thank you to the panel for generating such a lively and interesting discussion and so many responses. I'm very conscious we, all of the questions have not been answered, but um, I'm equally clear that integration and inclusion are, as you have all said, a very fundamental and really important part of the compacts that are now being negotiated. It's clear to me also that one size does not fit all, that there are complexities that need to be dealt with, there are issues that need to be dealt with, and need to be identified. And it's also clear that if we are to look to comprehensive planning, it needs to start at a global level, but there are national, national contexts within which it's placed, and there are also local realities that need to respond to it, not on an ad hoc basis, but in an integrated and cohesive fashion, so that the common understandings of how we live together can actually lead towards a democratic and cohesive society, as indeed one of you said already, and so that all forms of discrimination can be eliminated from the process of integration. I'm conscious that there are such things in all of the conventions and in all of the treaties as special measures. And for me, if we are to look to real integration and inclusion of migrants, we're going to have to look to some of those special measures, which, which are not about favouritism. They're about creating, to use the sporting analogy, a living playing pitch. Thank you all very much, and my apologies that we ran a little bit over. Thank you.